Metro Bank, right, had lost his post loss of 100 million, okay? But it's like, oh, it's only 100 million, you know, we're going we're gonna to have growth, we're opening up new branches up north, and, you know, more deposits are going to pour in, and it's all fine, and everyone's happy with it, the regulator's happy with it, you know? So, you have to understand that Metro Bank is the closest of what we have about BCCI, it's an American bank, okay? All right, and um, the point is with Metro, the interesting thing is it's got the same structure as BCCI did in the UK. It's growing extremely fast, but no one's raising any eyebrows. You know what they're saying now? They're saying, oh, we welcome the competition. We need more banks in the UK. We want more retail branches. This is what's going on. So there's a, you know, it's a stark difference. And the owner, Mr. Vernon Hill, huge successful. He's like, you know, like Donald Trump in the USA. He's a you know, uh, really, really successful. And he's opened up Metro Bank, and he's doing the business model of BCCI, what BCCI started, truly international level, not a Pakistani mentality, a truly international mentality of having slick offices. Look at these. A BCCI branch would be looking like a five-star hotel if anybody went into it. So this is what Metro, Metro Bank is focused on customer service, Sunday banking. This is not a promotion for Metro Bank, by the way. I'm just saying that they're using tools and customer service techniques which BCCI was doing over 30 years ago, which UBL was doing. I hope that changes Let we start opening Sunday and giving personal experience, again, sleep branches like they did in the 70s and 80s, okay? This is what was going on. So, if it was okay for Metro Bank, why, is it, why wasn't it okay for BCCI? I'm not going to go through all this, we're running out of time, we're going to wrap up now in about five minutes, sorry for that. The thing is that um, these are things we need for the Pakistani industry, the Pakistani banking industry to actually, to hit Wall Street again. And I'd urge all of you to do that, okay? We need a visionary, we need to institutionalize the bank. The visionary meaning someone like Alas and Abdi. It could be any one of you sitting here right now. I'm not just saying it. I'm saying this is not a motivational speech. I'm actually telling you, Alas and Abdi had an idea. He ran with it. All of you could have an idea. And run with it. I'm giving you the idea now. You need to start a bank. You need to do it. This is what you need to do. I'm telling you, if it was done back then and Metro Bank's doing it now, and mainly the main thing was that the UK wasn't giving banking licenses easy, right? Even BCI wasn't giving a it wasn't given a full banking license, it was only limited as a licensed deposit taker in the UK and in the USA it was only limited as an agency. You know, it was prejudiced from the beginning. So you need to have an organized structure, equal opportunities. I'm talking about Pakistan banking here. This is what Pakistan needs to do to, to get out to the forefront, to make one of its banks so we can see Faisal Bank and, and MCB all over and people. I want a time where we get some fresh graduate from Oxford, Cambridge, LSC, Imperial, Kings, an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scottishman, an American, and I want them to send the CV to Karachi and say, I want to work for your bank. That's what should be happening, and it can. All these things, but at the bottom, you need real management, you need humility, you need purpose of giving, you need to give back to society. That's what BCCI was great at. It opened up the best hospital in the world called Conwell Hospital. You might have heard of it, it's the one of the best private hospitals. BCCI created that, it's running the Infarc. Foundation, which is being run by Mr. Swali Nakwi in, in Karachi, it's got the Orangi project. It uh, funded and established the Banking and Finance Center at City University. The Money Banking and Finance uh, degree was funded, the CAS Business School was funded, the PYBT, Princess Youth Business Trust, the Princess Trust for Prince Charles, was funded by BCCI. Numerous other projects, which I can't mention here if you read in my book. This is the other main thing that we need to focus on, the final thing compliance, risk management, and AML. I gave AML training in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia briefly. You need to incorporate all these in your banks, in your Pakistani banks. AML policy and program, which is having KYC efforts so you know your customer so well that you should know what transaction he's going to do before he even does it. Ongoing monitoring, due diligence, raise SARs and CTRs when needed. Don't shy away from the opportunity. Record keeping and reporting is paramount. You need to uh, appoint a designated MRO, which is a money laundering reporting officer, so you're on the, on the good side of the regulator. And I give that advice to all banks. You have independent testing and internal controls. And all of these regulations you see here now, FCA, PRA, JMSLG, FATF, 40 recommendations, the Basel uh, 3 guidelines, from Basel, leading off Basel 1 and 2, the fourth money laundering directive, the Wolfsburg Group guidelines, the FATCA, the Foreign Assets Tax um, guidelines from the USA, regulated by the Banking Secrecy Act, FinCEN. OCC or CEC, which is getting on like really, really fiercely right now. And then the UAE as well. All of these people are on fire right now. They're after blood with all these banks, right? No one's getting shut down, but they're after blood. So the compliance measures and AML measures need to be restringent, even though banks are facing losses like RBS yesterday, 8 billion pounds, I believe. They posted 8 billion pounds of losses 
2013, and you own this bank, by the way. You own it. You fund, you funded it. Okay? The future. The future is bright, ladies and gentlemen. This is what you need to do. Pakistan has the potential. I hope I've proven that Pakistan has the potential to create a bank which can rival Wall Street. And it will. And you have, the main thing is, uh, you know, the, the only person who's probably uh, affected me uh, more, you know, than, well, I wouldn't say, but, but, you know, if anyone has affected me more than God afterwards, is that I've had the influence of, of, of my father. And when you have humility and giving with a true purpose in your life, so whichever jobs you do, some people are doctors here, some people are accountants, lawyers, you know, you have shopkeepers, anything you do, if you do it with a sense of purpose of giving, so it's not just a job, you have a, a moral purpose attached to your goal and to your job, you will do wonders. And this is a fact. And this, you know, uh, my book will uh, be touching on, that, uh, touching on that as well. And you know, there's a saying by, uh, by Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, which is one of my favorite quotes. It says that there are two seekers, of not, uh, two seekers who will never ever you know, be satisfied. One is the seeker of this world, the worldly pleasures, and the other is the seeker of knowledge. You will never be satisfied. People who are seeking worldly pleasures, you will be able to have the best Rolls Royce Phantom, the biggest house, the largest bank account, but you will never get happiness. Okay? I saw that I've seen money in Saudi Arabia, I hated it, I came back, I was living in the desert, I hated it. You know? I'm on the verge of unemployment now, but you know, still at the end of the day. And the seeker of knowledge, you know, you will never be satisfied. You can seek again and again and again, you can do a PhD, you can do many degrees, but seeker of knowledge will never be satisfied. And in terms of Pakistan and Pakistan banking, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, Pakistan's in the bottom. But you know, you know, Allah says, it, in the, you know, you, he'll never change the state of the people until they help themselves, okay? So people who say it to you, you know, people watching in Pakistan, this will go on YouTube, hopefully, and, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, but you know, Pakistanis, you know, we're, you know, we're very uh, this and that, and you know, we're going to change the world, we're very strong, and Pakistan's in the bottom. You see the youth really energetic. Why aren't, why isn't the youth using this energy and creating a revolt. Oh, so it happened in Syria, it's happened in Egypt, it's happened in, in uh, all these other places in Yemen or not. Why aren't they getting out the, out the seats out of the backside and doing it in Pakistan? Get rid of these people. But, you know, they're too scared. Just like you're too scared to open up a truly international bank again because of your reputation. So I urge everyone, you know, I urge the people who are on the screen as well, to start up an international bank, to start up a true international bank, even with limited resources, but the business model is there now. If Metro Bank is having losses, it doesn't matter. It will come. You need to start up a truly international bank. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Which, which means, do not be disappointed in the youth of Pakistan of today. Because, you know, with time, it has a lot of potential. And that's the future, guys. And if you urge everyone with trust, integrity, and humility, you can create a truly international bank. And Pakistan can be a beacon for banking success where people you'd like to go and say oh you're Pakistan, you work for such and such bank people will be sending your CDs just like they did 20 years ago and that's how I'd like to thank you so much for listening thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, you have any questions and, uh, second question was my second question was um, so you said that like, there are a number of regulators yes. around the world yeah uh, which basically forced BCCI to shut down. Globally, so why, why didn't it just close in one place and why global? Well, my, my, my point is that if there were if there were a massive presence in the Middle East, that's where their like central hub was. Um, and of course, as you sort of alluded earlier, they're being funded by like the Middle East world. Yeah. So what, why did they shut down? Globally? So so basically, what they wanted this this is what the Bank of England uh, under pressure from the US, which is documented in the Lord Justice Bingham Report of 1992. I can provide you copies later on, it will be on my website and it will be uh, in the book as well, that um, the Bank of England froze the assets in the UK and revoked the license and the head office was in the London, it was incorporated in Luxembourg globally, so it was an SA, an overseas company, they were both incorporated, okay, they were trying to incorporate in London but they couldn't, they didn't get the license, so earlier they were trying to restructure, there was a restructuring going on, okay, so that they will incorporate a UK entity but they didn't allow that. Had they incorporated in the UK, it would have been different. And they were going to separate. So there was a restructuring going on literally just weeks before they shut the bank down, where they would have, they would shut down US operations. They were going to streamline it into three entities, UK, Europe, and Far East, Middle East, okay? But they didn't allow it to happen. They didn't allow it to go ahead. They revoked the license in the court in Luxembourg, and so global operations were shut. And then 
Bank of England and the US Justice Department, they phoned up every regulator in the countries, like you said, Middle East and everyone, to shut that. To you also do the same, what we've done. Some of them refused to do it, and then under pressure they had to, when the, when the main head office and the, you know, it's been shut and everything, and they had to shut globally, they were brought to their knees. And the, uh, there's a run on the bank, there was a run on the bank because everyone took the deposits out, so naturally it would, it would have collapsed anyway. The money laundering case, which was the fake money laundering case, the sting operation, had caused so much negative media that everyone wanted their money out. BCCI lost almost two billion in deposits in two weeks because of the negative media, you know? So it would have collapsed anyway had Sheikh Zayed injected the money. But the fact is that Sheikh Zayed injected the money and was always the lender of last resort. Many people say, oh, there was no central bank, no lender of last resort. There was, Sheikh Zayed. Can't question his, his, his money and his authority. So I hope that answers your question. Anything out of this, a lesson out of this closure of BCCI? Have you people have learned any lesson out of this? You people, as a me personally, or? Uh, no, everybody in the bank itself. Yes. Have they learned anything out of this? Well, I know. Here, here, here are so many theories going on. We're talking about double standard, all that. We're going to live in this very world. Yes. A double standard. Yeah. How do you fortify your next venture, the future venture of BCCI? Well, as I, as I, uh, very good question. Thank you so much, Dr. So the, the, uh, as I document, as I mentioned earlier, when you incorporate all the things which I mentioned with humility and giving and professionalism, and make sure that the regulation is correct. So BC said the biggest flaw was that, you know, it was set up in a way that you know there's very little regulation going on, so it became an easy target. So the lesson that we learn now is to make sure regulation is in place. Make sure. Yeah, make sure the regulation is in place and you have a, have a central, you do have a central bank regulating uh, the authority and make sure it's segmented. So you might agree that it's not a double standard. It's a standard which was not followed by us. Yeah, I also agree that there are many mistakes that we did. There were many mistakes that the, the bank did, not we, but the bank. And uh, you learn lessons from that. And the main thing is that, you know, it should have been shut down anyway, but that's, that's history now. The main thing is how we move forward and you learn the lessons. Exactly. Thank you so much. When's the book out? The book is finished. We're looking for a publisher. So anybody watching out there, <laughs> you who know, wants to publish the book, please, yeah, please you know, contact me on my email and Twitter. And uh, you know, we'll be, I'm hoping the summer. It's basically the book's uh, finished. Just a little touch-up because there's new fines and penalties happening every day. So I'm just going to be updating that. And the book, hopefully, uh, with your help and prayers, will be out in the summer. Uh, we hope to release it uh, internationally, globally, and you know. It's mainly the main thing to remember, that that's the main thing which I want to say. It's not a soft story for a Pakistani bank who maligned. It's all facts. If you look at the crimes, and look at the crimes committed on a global scale now by these banks, it's all facts. The double standard is based on the enforcers, not the banks. So that's the main thing to remember, yes. Uh, you mentioned before about how you wanted to invite the Pakistani institutions to set up mm -hmm. large scale retail businesses in the UK. Yep. Do you not, I mean, I slightly differ in my opinion. I, I'm all for Pakistani business within financial services or any other type of industry being prominent within Europe and outside of Pakistan. But the scope of retail banking that's required to make retail banking successful requires a lot of investment and yeah. not necessarily too much value add. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if a Pakistani bank like our bank, UBL, mm -hmm. only has six branches, for us to compete with the Barclays or the lawyers or the HSBCs of the world, means a huge capital investment and you're not guaranteed to get much return because there's very little that you will provide to your customers yeah. uh, in, uh, in competition with the other banks. But I think one thing that you briefly touched upon is that Pakistan, uh, Pakistani banks focus a lot on remittances mm. and a lot of other sources of fee income. And yeah. I think if there was some kind of financial service institution that could focus on generating fee income through different services, be that through remittances, be that through other forms of banking that <coughs> target um, uh, Pakistani audiences, such as I think a lot of people are giving out uh, secured loans against gold, because a yeah. lot of people within our community have a lot of gold. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those kind of services will be more successful. Moving towards an environment where branch banking is going down, and people are concentrating more on branch list banking, and they're going to mobile banking, I'm not so sure that it would be practical or worthwhile people investing in the large retail network. Fair enough, but at the end of the day, then we can have another debate on that soon. The point is that Fine, online banking, mobile banking is is um, you know is, is up and coming, and we actually missed out Islamic banking as well, which was on the slide, but that's also up and coming. A lot of people using Shari for compliant banking. But the main thing is yes, there are there are negatives in it as well. It may not work, but then you know if you don't give it a try, the main thing is that we're trying to get Pakistan on the map again in the banking world. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, finally, yes, last. Um, I don't want you to, to have a conspiracy theory on this, but if if another Pakistani institution was to grow at the scale that and someone took the initiative to do that. Do you think enough is changing the West for it to... 
enough has changed as in... Why do you think the West will accept it? Well, that's the thing now. I'm saying that why wouldn't they accept it? So if we have all the capital in place, the requirements, and we follow the regulations to follow to incorporate a UK entity um, in line with the FCA, PRA, and FCA regulations, of it's in America, FinCEN, BSA, or whatever, there should, there shouldn't be a reason of why they shouldn't accept it. If, because the main thing with PCTI was that because of the poor regulation, that's why they didn't allow it and had no clear um, uh, owner. But I think also that you have to allude to how much of its success was down to its loose structure. It was pure success because of the backing and the deposits, and it was growing really, really fast. It was the backing, there was no, it was very clear that the structure, they, the, 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 people think that it was unclear, it wasn't. The main thing is if you follow, as Darius mentioned, if you follow the regulations and the rules, it's like you're opening up an account at Barclays. If you ask for ID, you ask for your address, your proof of address, your proof of income, or whatever, you get it, you open the account. Why would they refuse an account? Because they don't like your face. They're not going to do that. You've got a beautiful face. But I'm saying that, you know, if you've got all the requirement and the paperwork, there's no reason. I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much.